All right, all of my dearest hoot reading friends. Page 154. Um, remember Roy just kind of got busted by his parents, and now he's having to go and speak with his father in the den of doom. <clears throat> Page 154, top. I'm assuming he said to Roy that the book will cast some light on today on tonight's strange events. Roy handed it across the desk. You and Mom got it for me two Christmases ago. I remember, his father said, scanning the cover, the Sibley Guide to Birds. Sure it wasn't for your birthday? <clears throat> I'm sure it had. Roy had put the book on his Christmas list after it had settled a friendly wager between him and, him and his father. One afternoon, they'd seen a large reddish-brown raptor swoop down and snatch a ground squirrel off a cattle range in the Gallatin... And they probably, maybe Galatian, I'm not sure, River Valley? I don't think it's Galatian, I think it's Galatian. Roy's father had been had bet him a milkshake that the bird was a young bald eagle whose crown feathers hadn't turned white yet, but Roy had said it was a fully grown golden eagle, more common to the dry prairies. Later, after visiting the Bozeman Library and consulting Sibley, Roy's father conceded that Roy had been right. Mr. Eberhardt held up the book and asked, What does this have to do with that nonsense at the hospital? Check out page 278, Roy said. I marked it for you. His father flipped the book open to that page. Burrowing Owl, he read aloud from the text. Athen Cuniclera. Yeah, I jacked that, sorry. <clears throat> Long-legged and short-tailed, with relatively long, narrow wings and flat head. Only small owl likely to be seen, perched in the open in the daylight. His father peered quizzically at him over the top of the book. Is this connected to the science project you were supposedly working on this afternoon? There is no science project, Roy admitted, and the hamburger meat that your mother gave you, a snack for the owls. Continue, Mr. Eberhardt said. It's a long story, Dad. I got nothing but time, buddy. I added the buddy, because that's what I would say to my son. All right, Roy said. In some ways, he thought wearily, a spanking might be easier. It usually is. <clears throat> See, there's this boy, he began, about the same age as me. Roy told his father everything. Well, almost everything. He didn't mention that the snakes distributed by the Beatrice Leap's stepbrother were highly poisonous and that the boy had actually taped their mouths shut. Such details might have alarmed Mr. Everhart more than the petty acts of vandalism. Roy also chose not to reveal that Beatrice had nicknamed her stepbrother Mullet Fingers, just in case Roy's father felt legally obligated to report it to the police or file it away in some government computer bank. Otherwise, Roy told what he knew about the running boy. His father listened without interruption. Dad, he's really not a bad kid, Roy said when he finished. All he's trying to do is save the owls. Mr. Everhart, Mr. Everhart remained silent for a few moments. He reopened the Sibley Guide and looked at the colored drawings of the small birds. See, if the Mother Paula's people bulldoze that property, they'll bury all the dens, Roy said. His father put the book aside and looked at Roy fondly, though with a trace of sadness. Roy, they own the property. They can do pretty much whatever they please. But they've probably got all the necessary paperwork and permits. They've got permits to bury owls, Roy asked in disbelief. The owls will fly away. They'll find new dens somewhere else. What if they've got babies? How will the baby birds fly away? Roy shot back angrily. How, Dad? I don't know, his father admitted. How would you and Mom like it, Roy pressed on, if a bunch of strangers showed up one day with bulldozers to flatten the house, and all they had to say was, Don't worry, Mr. and Miss Everhart. It's no big deal. Just pack up and move to another place. How would you feel about that? Roy's father stood up slowly, as if the weight of a hundred bricks were on his shoulders. Let's go for a walk, he said. It was a calm, cloudless night, and a pale sliver of moon peeked over the rooftops. Insects as thick as confetti swirled around the cowls of the streetlights. Toward the end of the block, two cats could be heard yowling at each other. Hands stuffed in his pockets. You're growing up fast, he remarked, catching Roy by surprise. Dad, I'm the third shortest kid in my homeroom. That's not what I meant. As they went along, Roy... Hopped from crack to crack on the sidewalk. They talked about comfortable talk topics, school sports, sports in school, until Roy nudged the conversation back to the delicate subject of mullet fingers. He needed to know where his father stood. <clears throat> you remember that day last summer we floated the Madison Canyon? Sure, said his father, in the inner tubes. Right, said Roy. And remember we counted five great horned owls in the cottonwood? Five. Yes, I remember. And you tried to take a picture with the camera fell in the river? Not exactly. I dropped it in the river, Roy's father recalled, sheep recalled sheepishly. Hey, it was a cheapo disposable. Yeah, but it would have been a great snapshot. Five in the same tree. Yes, yeah, said Roy. That was pretty amazing. 
The owl story did the trick. His father took the cue. This boy you told me about, you really don't know his name? He won't tell me, and neither will Beatrice, Roy said. That's the honest truth. He didn't take his stepfather's last name, Leap? No, not according to Beatrice. And you say he doesn't attend school. Roy's spirits fell. Fell. It sounded as if his father intended to report mullet fingers for truancy. What worries me, Mr. Everhart said, is the family situation. It doesn't sound too good. No, it's not, Roy conceded. That's why he doesn't live at home anymore. Aren't there any relatives who can take care of him? He feels safe where he is, Roy said. You're sure about that? How can I if I don't even know where to find him? Roy's father gave him a wink. But I'll tell you what I am going to do. I'm going to spend some time thinking seriously about all this, and you should too. Okay, said Roy. How could he possibly think of anything else? Even his battle with Dana Matherson seemed like a fuzzy long-ago dream. We'd better head home, his father said. It's getting late, and you've had a long day. His father said, it's getting late, and you've had a long day. A real long day, Roy agreed. But after he got into bed, he couldn't fall asleep. His body was exhausted, but his mind was awake, buzzing with the day's turbulence. He decided to do some reading and reached for a book titled A Land Remembered which he'd checked out from school. It was the story of a family who lived in Florida back in the 1850s when it was still a wilderness. Humans were scarce and the swamps and the woods teemed with wildlife. Probably a pretty good time to be a burrowing owl, Roy mused. An hour later, he was half dozing when he heard a tap tap on the bedroom door. It was his mother slipping in to say goodnight. She took the book from his hands and turned off the lamp in the nightstand and then she sat down on the bed and asked how he was feeling. Beat, Roy said. Gently, she snugged the covers up to his neck. Even though he was way too warm, Roy didn't object. It was the mom thing. She couldn't help herself. Honey, she said, you know how much we love you? Oh, Roy thought, here it comes. But what she did at the hospital tonight, letting that other boy use your name to get in the emergency ward? It was my idea, Mom, not his. And I'm sure your heart was in the right place, she said. But it was still a lie, technically speaking, providing false information or whatever. It's a serious matter, honey. I know. And it's just, well, your father and I don't want to see you get in trouble, even for the sake of a friend. Roy raised himself up on one elbow. He would have run away before he'd give out his real name, and I couldn't let that happen. He was sick. He needed to see a doctor. I understand. Believe me, I do. They were asking him all kinds of nosy questions, Mom, and meanwhile he's about to keel over from the fever, Roy said. Maybe what I did was wrong, but I'd do it all over again if I had to, and I mean it. Roy expected a mild rebuke, but his mother only smiled. Smoothing the blanket with both hands, she said, Honey, sometimes you're going to be faced with situations where the line isn't clear between what's right and what's wrong. Your heart will tell you <clears throat> to do one thing, and your brain will tell you to do the something different. In the end, all that's left is to look at both sides and go with your best judgment. Well, thought Roy, that's sort of what I did. This boy, his mother said, why wouldn't he give out his real name, and why did he run away from the hospital like that? Muller, mullet fingers had escaped through a window in the woman's restroom next door to the x-ray department. He left his torn green shirt dangling from the antenna <coughs> of Officer David Delinka's patrol car, which was parked outside the emergency room. He probably ran, Roy said, because he was afraid somebody would call his mom. So? So she doesn't want him anymore. She'll have him locked up in juvenile hall. What? His mom sent him off to military school, Roy explained, and now she doesn't want him back. She said so herself in front of Beatrice. Roy's mother cocked her head as if she wasn't sure that she'd heard <coughs> him correctly. His mom doesn't want him. Roy saw something flash in her eyes. He wasn't certain if it was sorrow or anger or both. She doesn't want him, his mother repeated. Roy nodded somberly. Oh my, she said. The words came out so softly that Roy was startled. He heard pain in his mother's voice, and he felt very bad for telling her that part of Mullet story. I'm sorry, Mom, Roy said. I love you. I love you too, honey. She kissed his cheek and tucked in the sheets one more time. As she was shutting the door, he saw her hesitate and turned back to look at him. We're proud of you, Roy. You need to know that. Your father and I are both extremely proud. Did Dad tell you about the owls? Yeah, he told me. It's too bad. Well, what should I do? What do you mean? Nothing, Roy said, sinking into his pillow. Good night. She'd already answered the question anyway. All he had to do was settle the argument between his heart and his brain. Chapter 14 Luckily, the next day was Saturday, so Roy didn't have to get up too early to catch the school bus. As he sat down for breakfast, the phone rang. It was Garrett. He'd never before called Roy, but now he wanted him to go skateboarding at the outlet mall. I don't have a skateboard, remember? Roy said, that's okay, I've got an extra. No thanks, I can't make it today. The true reason that Garrett had called was, of course, to find out what had happened to Dana Matherson at Trace Middle. Dude, somebody tied him to a flagpole. It wasn't me, said Roy. On the topic, he couldn't talk freely in front of his parents. Then who and how, Garrett demanded. No comment, said Roy, echoing mullet fingers. Oh, come on, Everhart. 
See you Monday. After breakfast, his father drove him to the bicycle shop to pick up the new tire, and by noon, Roy was fully mobile again. An address for L.B. Leak was listed in the phone, phone book, and Roy had no difficulty locating the house. It was on West Oriel Avenue, the same street as the bus stop where he'd first spotted the running boy. In the Leap driveway, he sat a dented old Suburban and a shiny new Camaro convertible. Roy leaned his bike against the mailbox post and hurried up the sidewalk. He heard voices bickering inside the house, and he hoped it was only a TV show with the volume turned up. After three firm knocks, the door swung open, and there stood Leon Leap, all six feet nine inches of him. He wore baggy red gym shorts and a sleeveless mesh jersey that exposed a pale, kettle-sized body. Leon looked as if he hadn't spent five minutes in the exercise room since retiring from pro basketball. All that remained of his NBA physique was his height. Roy tilted back on his heels in order to see Leon's face, and his expression was perturbed and preoccupied. Beatrice home? Roy asked. Yeah, but she's kind of busy right now. Only take a minute, Roy said. It's about school. Oh, school, said Leon, as if he'd forgotten where his daughter went five days a week. With a curious grunt, he lumbered off. A moment later, Beatrice appeared, and she looked stressed. Can I come in? Roy asked. No, she whispered. It's a bad time. Then can you come out? Nah, Beatrice glanced anxiously behind her. You heard what happened at the hospital? She nodded. Sorry I didn't get back in time to help. Is your brother okay? Roy asked. Better than he was, said Beatrice. Who's there? Who is that? demanded a chilly voice from the hallway. Just a friend. A boy? Yeah, a boy, Beatrice said, rolling her eyes for Roy's benefit. A woman not much taller than Beatrice materialized in the doorway behind her. She had a sharp nose, beady, suspicious eyes, and a wild fountain of curly auburn hair. Blue smoke curled from a cigarette poised in her glittering fingertips. It could only be Lana, the mother of mullet fingers. Who are you? she asked. My name's Roy. What do you want, Roy? Lana took a nosy noisy drag off the cigarette. It's about school, Beatrice said. Yeah, well, it's Saturday, said Lana. Roy gave it a try. I'm really sorry to bother you, Mrs. Leap. Beatrice and I are doing a science project together. Not today you're not, Lana cut him off. Miss Beatrice here, here will be busy cleaning the house and the kitchen and the bathrooms and anything else I can think of. And that is where we'll stop. Top page 166. Hope you guys are enjoying it. Got any other books you want me to uh, read? Let me know. Have a great day.